um, potential ordinances for tenant protection. Uh, this has been a work in progress. I wanna thank council member Hallie Burton for his partnership in this. Um, and tonight, today our goal with this is to kind of walk through with each of you um, some possible ordinances that would protect renters here in Boise. You know, and one of them in particular, I wanna point out, we saw in the news, gosh, it was probably a month ago, five weeks ago, um, the apartments that on a Friday, tenants were told they needed to leave. And that's just one example of what, you know, could potentially be many, but it really begged the question again, as we were working on this, what can a city do to make sure that um, renters have some protections built into the agreements they have with landlords so that we don't find ourselves, you know, in an emergency situation trying to um, keep folks housed and work through um, where they might go with, with such last minute notifications. And I just think that that's one of the examples that over the years, many of us um, have been concerned about. And so today, Nikki is presenting several different options um, that together we believe um, could provide some protections to our residents to make sure that you know, people are staying housed, that we have affordable homes um, for everyone. Um, and then those that have them have some certainty as to how things would wind down if they do. Great, thanks very much, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, again, I'm Nikki Olivier Hellenkamp. I work on housing issues in the mayor's office. Thanks so much for uh, the chance to be with you all today. Um, and as the mayor mentioned, as our community has grown and changed, we've seen the market change significantly for renters in Boise. I don't think it's news to anyone here that rents have increased substantially in recent years and that low vacancy rates have resulted in a lack of options, even for tenants who may have the means to pay. We've also heard a range of concerns from community members and from groups who work closely with tenants, from seniors who've seen their rents rise while their incomes stay fixed, from tenants who are being displaced, and from, resi from residents who may meet the required qualifications to rent a home, but are turned away because some of their income comes from sources like child support or public assistance. It's worth noting that state law prevents the city from taking certain actions to address these issues. For example, some in our community have called for measures that would limit the amount that rents can increase, uh, which is not currently allowable under state law. So uh, even given these restrictions, there are some actions that the city could take in an effort to provide additional consumer protections for tenants in Boise, and which would build on the work that this council has done in the past, including the city's rental application fee ordinance. And that's why we're bringing you this package of protections to consider. There are four policies that we'll discuss, which would prohibit retaliatory conduct, would require that tenants be provided with a notice of landlord and tenant responsibilities, would prohibit discrimination based on a potential tenant source of income, and would require that landlords provide relocation assistance when tenants are being displaced because a building is being demolished or substantially renovated or because its use is being changed. You may notice that the late fee cap that you discussed as a council previously isn't included here. That's because the legislature took action in this space this last session by passing legislation that fees be reasonable and that they be disclosed in a lease agreement. I'll also say that this is in no way an exhaustive list. Instead, it's meant to be a starting place for a conversation. And we don't have ordinance drafts at this stage. We're really just looking in this work session for a policy discussion and for some feedback and direction from council on these ideas. So for this first one around prohibiting retaliatory conduct, the goal here is that tenants can do things like requesting repairs and raising safety concerns without fear of retaliation. Uh, this kind of prohibition would simply state that renters are able to bring forward these types of concerns, make repair requests, become a member of a community resident association, and retain counsel without fear of retaliation. And when we're talking about retaliation, that's specifically in the form of termination or non-renewal of tenancy, rent increases or decreases in services. If any of that language sounds familiar to you, it may be because it's from the Idaho Manufactured Home Residency Act, which has explicitly provided these protections to residents of mobile home parks in Idaho since 1980. Uh, especially in a tight rental market, tenants may hesitate to take actions that they fear could be viewed negatively by their landlords, such as requesting repairs or voicing concerns. And this type of provision also benefits landlords, a dynamic in which tenants fear raising issues creates the risk for greater costs to those property owners who may not be notified by tenants of smaller repair needs until they escalate into larger and more expensive problems. 
Next on our list is a required notice of landlord and tenant responsibilities. I'll pause here and say that with this protection and several of the others included here, some of these are things that landlords in our community are already providing, right? Um, and so the goal here really is to standardize that these are basic things that any tenant should be able to expect. So many landlords in our community already provide this in the form of a resident handbook or some other version. Um, but essentially the goal here would be that all parties know their rights and responsibilities when entering into a landlord tenant relationship. It would require that landlords provide new tenants with this notice, which would be a document that lays out in simple language the existing legal protections and requirements under the law for landlords and tenants. So similar to how federal law already requires that landlords provide new tenants with an informational pamphlet about lead-based paint hazards, right? You're required to get that when you are signing your lease. This would operate in a similar, or this could operate in a similar manner. The notice would include information related to legal requirements around the amount of notice that must be given for rent increases and non-renewal of leases, information about making repair requests, etc. The city would be responsible for creating and maintaining the accuracy of the notice and for making it available online. The landlord would be responsible for providing new tenants with either a printed copy or a link to the online version. When tenants don't know their rights and responsibilities, it makes it easier for bad actors to violate existing law, for example, by failing to provide proper notice before initiating a rent increase or including clauses in a lease that don't conform to Idaho code, which is something there have been some news articles about uh, here. For example, stating in a lease that the formal process of eviction required by the law does not need to be followed. It can also mean that tenants may not be aware of what is required of them for example, the amount of notice that they're required to give when deciding not to renew their lease. In addition, we do have new legislation, for example, the law I mentioned earlier that requires that fees be disclosed in a lease agreement that tenants and landlords may or may not be aware of. So the goal here, again, is to provide information in a brief format in plain language to ensure that all parties are aware of their rights and responsibilities when signing something as important as a lease agreement. Okay, the next one on the list is prohibiting source of income discrimination. And the goal here would be that prospective tenants who meet a landlord's rental criteria can secure housing regardless of their source of income. This would prohibit discrimination based on a potential tenant's lawful, verifiable source of income. This is inclusive of child support, retirement programs, veterans benefits, and public, private, or nonprofit administered benefits, including, for example, the emergency rental assistance program that has been facilitated through the housing authority in recent years and section eight vouchers. It does not, it, this would not require a landlord to rent to an applicant who does not otherwise qualify for tenancy, but does prohibit a denial that is solely based on the source of income. And just for some context, over 125 cities have implemented some kind of source of income discrimination ordinance, as have 21 states, including Utah, North Dakota, and Colorado. Although some are broader and only provide protections to tenants using public assistance, such as a Section 8 voucher. Okay, and the last one here is relocation assistance. The goal here is that tenants receive assistance if they're being displaced due to demolition, substantial renovation, or a change of use. Of the concepts we're discussing today, this is a newer one in terms of a city playing a role in it. And as a result, there's a significant opportunity for feedback from you and from stakeholders, including tenants and property owners and managers to craft an option here that really strikes the right balance for Boise. Our community, as the mayor mentioned, has seen recent cases where tenants have been displaced. Uh, and we have seen examples where tenants specifically have been displaced by development. Often these are longtime tenants who may need more than the 30 days that landlords are currently required to give in terms of notice to secure a new housing option. We've also seen landlords approach these situations in a variety of ways, with some providing only the 30 days notice required by law, some, as in the case of the Reidenbaugh apartments, entering into voluntary agreements in which 12 months of notice are given, uh, and something in the neighborhood of $4,000 in relocation assistance for households. In the case of Arbor Village, we saw that property owner offering 60 days instead of the 30 required by law um, with no financial assistance. And we've other, also seen other actions taken, such as connecting tenants with resources, assisting with them in their housing search, 
honoring reasonable requests for a delay in move out date and guaranteeing full return of security deposits. And one thing that I think is also worth noting is that the updated zoning code uh, takes some action toward addressing this issue by including a provision that requires that in the zones that are seeing more significant changes and where the site has been used previously in the last three years as a mobile home community, assisted living or nursing home or affordable housing, new development there will require a conditional use permit, which would trigger a public hearing at planning and zoning. A standalone relocation assistance requirement would complement this by establishing predictability and uniformity in terms of the manner of assistance that is expected from property owners in this situation, whether that means additional notice, financial assistance, or some other action. And this, the goal here would be to provide consistency, again, for both tenants and property owners as they're approaching this situation. Um, if this is something that the council would like to see additional work on, we would, and I'll say this about any of these issues, that we would certainly engage in some deeper stakeholder engage, engagement to work toward crafting an option that would right-size this for Boise and for Idaho law. And so in terms of next steps, with the direction of council, that additional stakeholder outreach, I'll say we've done, um, we've had some, some initial conversations with our, with the landlord association, with property management companies, and with groups that work closely with tenants, um, but wanting to come to you for your feedback without, uh, before moving forward with, with those discussions and for your thoughts on key policy areas that we would really need to dig into with those groups. So with that, I can stand for any questions you might have. Madam Mayor, um, a couple of questions. I might start off just by um, adding a little bit more context specifically to the source of income. That's been one of the ones that I've sort of had my eye on pushing forward. One of the things that I think we see by a lot of members in our community is they apply for a variety of different financial assistance, maybe it's Section 8 vouchers. They're very difficult to get. And eventually they get one. Um, and it's a really big day and it's a big opportunity when they get that voucher and they have assistance to get into um, a house. And then what they find is that they go around and they start trying to apply for a place to rent. And they're oftentimes turned away um, with the explanation being, we don't take vouchers um, or we uh, don't take this uh, form, of, form of income. And so folks who have been on the waiting list to get a voucher approved, folks who've desperately in need of housing are now going to places and finding that they're turned away for no other reason um, except for that that particular uh, space does not take those types of vouchers. And I think one of the things, you know, if this was direction council would want ahead that we would need to make sure that we were doing would be working with some of our partners to make sure that there was education for how do you actually work with vouchers? Um, you know, what is the opportunity to do this? And who are the partners that are out there that can make this possible? So it's, it's definitely something that we see a real need in the community. And as Nikki mentioned, there are communities across the country who've implemented similar things and they have seen them be effective both in getting people into housing, but also getting people into more diverse neighborhoods. Um, so areas of, of, in, of mixed income or higher income that they may not be able to get into otherwise, and then all of the benefits that come in with that as well. So I just wanna offer that as just a little bit of extra um, context to that particular one. Um, I did have a question about the relocation assistance. Um, and the question about the relocation assistance is kind of how do you see that playing out as far as what does the financial assistance look like? Is that a month? Is that two to three months? You know, where, where are we sort of seeing that play out as far as an example goes? Sure. Madam Mayor, Council Member Halliburton, uh, something we've seen uh, as an approach to take on that is to essentially look at the cost of moving, which frequently is your first month's rent, your security deposit, and then your actual moving costs. So being able, one, one approach that you know you could take is to say, let's take a look at median rents for our area and then tie, tie a relocation assistance amount to those median rents. That is one possible way of doing that. Madam Mayor. So I have two questions. I think I'd, I'll start with um, just an overarching comment. I really love um, all of these uh, suggestions. I think these are really uh, great when we're thinking about trying to provide better protections for tenants. 
Um, I wanted to just point out one um, uh, one issue when I think about the the first one and the third one, the retaliation and the income discrimination um, pieces. I, I think it's it, these are both great um, protections to help damper some of uh, concerns. I think in these areas, but I do just want to note that, um, especially for those individuals from a lower socioeconomic status, the power imbalance that still exists between a landlord and a tenant. And um, in those instances um, where there is retaliation or there may be discrimination, there is um, a, a dearth of uh, support for legal services associated with um, those particular tenants. And so I would encourage us as part of this process to really engage Idaho Legal Aid and Intermountain Fair Housing Council on these issues because it has, you know, it's, it's a high burden um, to take a landlord to court on these issues and to prove both retaliation and income discrimination, especially when there's an opportunity when that's just solely income discrimination. There are many other ways to decide to decline to rent to an individual, especially given the low supply that we have of housing right now. So though I think these are incredibly important, I still have worries that um, we, we need even further protections or at least support for our uh, citizens in order to, um, when they are faced with retaliation or discrimination on these, these lenses. The other question I have, I think on um, the relocation assistance is at least in the materials, I believe that the focus right now has been on providing that relocation assistance to fixed term, uh, those uh, individuals with fixed term leases. And I have concerns on that because at least in my experience um, in dealing with mass evictions and um, in representing uh, in individuals, um, we have a history here in, in Idaho and in um, Boise in particular of a significant month-to-month -month leases and that we have uh, many of our citizens who have been in their homes for 20 plus years even who have been on a month-to-month -month lease for that entire period of time. And so I do have concerns that that relocation assistance is limited to fixed-term leases that will either see an increase of month to month leases, um, or we will be um, having lots of our citizens displaced without relocation assistance who have been on month to month leases for a long period of time. So I'd, I'd appreciate if we're moving this direction that we do a lot more um, evaluation on that issue. Madam Mayor, I have comments on all four, so if it's okay with you, I'll just walk through them. Um, first, thank you. And uh, much of this is good and things that I'm pretty much on board with, but just ticking through the list, in the retaliatory conduct um, suggestion, right? Nobody should fear retaliation and uh, retaliation shouldn't be a means of doing business. I'm concerned about non-renewal of tenancy being an element um, just because uh, it does seem one-sided to force a landlord tenant relationship for potentially years and years and years while a dispute over alleged retaliation is being solved. And in my mind, a landlord or a tenant should be able to walk away from each other within the terms of their agreement at any time. And so just flagging that non-renewal of tenancy kind of has a potential to shackle people to agreements for longer than they intended to be in them. So flagging that one. Um, I had a comment on, on two, the notices, but then you answered it. And it was, my, my question was in the materials that, that were submitted, three quarters of what I read really looked like terms that should be in a lease. And so my question was like, why not just require those things to be in the lease? But I think what I saw in your presentation was, you know, the notice that the city will prepare is broader, more notification of rights. Like your lease should have something in it about this without specific terms. So you answered that one and that's great. Um, the source of income discrimination, I agree um, with Council Pro Tem Halliburton really completely on that. The only thing that I would look for as this comes back is that legitimate means of screening tenants, for example, a credit check or you know, other tools that are used to verify that the person has an income without discriminating as to the source of that income seems important and fair for landlords to do. I'm really uncomfortable with the relocation assistance. It just makes me uncomfortable. I don't quite know how it would work. Um, like, is the city going to create a cause of action that people can then sue for, or is the city going to prosecute people, or are we going to withhold land use changes in order to enforce it? So that's kind of uncomfortable for me. And then, you know, each situation is different and valuing it with a generic formula to say, you know, here's how much money you're entitled to is, it doesn't feel like a great fit. So I'm still very uncomfortable with that one. But um, as you said, a lot more discussion needs to happen. I'll add to, um, Councilmember Haney Keith's comment, 
we heard an appeal last fall from an assisted living facility that really heightened these issues for us. I think that was very emotionally challenging. I think each one of those tenants was on a month to month lease. So um, that's important. And then the, the kind of the fifth thing to think about is whether this needs to apply to all landlords. Many people rent their basement or they own one unit or they rent a room in their house. And I'm not sure those are much more intimate, much more personal landlord tenant relationships. And I'm not sure they're really, they deserve to be subject to the same regulatory scheme as for example, a corporate mega landlord. So those are my pieces of feedback. Um, yep, that's all of them, thank you. Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, what I really appreciate about this is that we're doing this on the front end and we're getting a lot of feedback and you can see that we all have lots of different kinds of views on this. Um, so much of this makes sense. I mean, I think it's kind of like a well duh moment. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't be discriminated because of your source of income. I do agree with council member Bajan, you know, you, you should be able to have a credit chuck and make sure that you can afford to live there. I am uncomfortable with requiring a landlord to issue a cash payment if they decide to change the property. I think that goes too far. Uh, I think it will have a cost to the tenant because the, that money's got to come from somewhere. So it it may end up hurting the tenant in a way that I don't think is is helpful. And I'm 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 uncomfortable about the city creating that sort of um, mandate. So I want to put that on the record. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Thank you, uh, Ms. Helen Camp, for putting this together. Uh, I think there's a lot of good things in here. Um, I don't know if I have a solution, um, but uh, I, I would just um, maybe echo some of the sentiments of uh, council members, uh, Bajent and Willits. Um, but I, I think as the city was dealing with some conditional use permits last year uh, with that dealt with tenant display, displacement, um, I kept questioning if maybe we don't have the landlords, maybe the city has some liability here when we're approving changes of uses of land and how that affects tenants. Maybe there's a role for the city, even if there isn't necessarily um, a will to compel um, a private landowner to um, provide some um, relocation assistance. So um, I, I would just say in our conversations, especially around when we're the city is taking an active role, like in a conditional use permit setting, and there's relocation, maybe the, the city um, has some liability there. So I would just uh, flag that as a, as a possible remedy if there isn't uh, universal acceptance for um, compelling private landowners um, to offer relocation assistance. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the discussion a lot. When Nikki came to us several weeks ago with some of these um, very preliminary ideas, it was exciting to have the conversation about what we can do a little bit better. And it's great to hear everyone's thoughts on um, the ideas that she presented. Um, I'm glad that everyone had thoughts, um, came prepared, and has some really good discussion so that we can go forward and figure out what makes sense for us. So I just wanted to say thank you to Nikki for her work and for everyone um, coming ready to discuss this. Madam Mayor, um, I actually have a question for Nikki. It seems some of the, the bigger concerns are on our last one there, the relocation assistance. And I guess in my mind, I'm trying to figure out how, how this might work. Um, because I guess I didn't, when I originally heard it, I didn't really think that much about the landlord paying the cost. I thought a little bit more about the developer paying the cost. So if we have somebody coming in and we've got a apartment complex or a housing unit that's going to be transformed into something else, um, and that comes in front of council, it seems like we haven't seen it very often where the landlord would be the one that would be responsible for helping provide that relocation assistance and more so often with the developer, and maybe I'm not remembering that correctly, but can you provide any sort of context on to how this might work? Is it the landlord, is it the developer? In what types of situations would this happen? Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council Member, I think that is an important question to dig into. And I think as we kind of have some of this additional stakeholder engagement, we'll be able to get a clear sense of that. I will say that 
if we're limiting relocation assistance specifically to situations where essentially you've got tenants who are being displaced by development, where you've got demolition, change in use, as or significant rehab, that it is likely that you're seeing uh, the in terms of who would be responsible for payment, you're seeing a, a different cast of characters there versus a situation where it's simply, you know, here I have this, you know, duplex that I own and I'm going to be, I, you know, I would like the tenants to move out. And so I'm not renewing their lease, but there's no, um, there's no development happening associated with that. So I think it is something we can absolutely dig in a little bit farther on there. Yeah, Madam Mayor, just following up there. Yeah, I would appreciate that because I think that there's probably a variety of different ways that it, that it could work out. And I think specifically about some of the cases where we've had landlords, or not landlords, we've had developers volunteer to help pay for some relocation assistance. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the landlord in the process that was actually doing that. It was the developer that was coming in and changing the housing complex into something that was completely different. So I think that there's, you know, a variety of different situations that could occur there and us trying to figure out like, what is the goal um, and who are we trying to actually, um, well, we know who we're trying to help, but who is going to be the folks who might be providing these funds um, would be helpful. Great. Madam Mayor, I had one more question. Yeah, we'll take oh, one sure. more and then. Um, it's actually not a facetious question. It's a, it's a sort of serious question, but to what extent do we intend any of these to apply to short-term rentals, which are also landlord-tenant relationships? Ah, Madam Mayor, Council Member, that's a great question. And I think that as we as we look at the definition of tenant in our um, in our current code, that's something I've had some conversations with legal around and uh, Rob Lockwood's behind us, so he can correct me if I start saying things that aren't right as a non-lawyer. Um, but my understanding is that in our current code, there isn't necessarily a clear definition of tenant. And so I think that's an important component as well to be thinking about making sure that it is covering who we want it to cover and meeting a definition of tenant that our community can have a common understanding of. Great. Thank you very much, Nikki. Madam Mayor, I, I think that there is direction from council, you know, some concerns that have to be addressed. Um, and I do think that one of the things uh, that I think we would like to see is some of that stakeholder outreach to try to figure out, um, you know, how these might affect a variety of different things. So uh, I think that that's one of the things that we're hearing and then some additional concerns on that last one and, and trying to iron that out too. Great. All right. Thank you. This was a great discussion. Thanks, Nikki, for what you brought and look forward to conversation around what's next. And now we will move into the budget. 